what I want to do in this video is talk a little bit uh, just in general about what are the goals of physics and the, the methods that we use to try to achieve those goals in physics. Ideally, what are we shooting for when we're, when we're trying to make up a theory about physics? And this actually comes as a recommendation from my girlfriend, and I thought it was an excellent uh, video to make, so, so here we go. To begin with, we need to make a couple assumption of assumptions just about what our laws of physics could be like. So the first thing that we have to say is that the laws of physics must actually be knowable. There, there have to be laws of physics. And, and they also have to be testable. I have to be able to do an experiment and say, if I set up a certain experimental apparatus and, and do an experiment and get some results and then start over from the beginning and set up exactly the same experiment, I should be able to get results that are consistent. So, so it should be a repeatable, uh, repeatable laws of physics. So, so that's the first assumption. The second is that if I have a set of laws of physics, they should be the same everywhere. If I uh, see hydrogen being fused into helium in the center of the sun, then a star a million light years away, if I see that it's burning hydrogen, it should be burning in the same way. If I needed a separate set of laws of physics for every point in space, well, that doesn't really uh, give it any predictive power if I have to come up with a whole new set everywhere I go in space. So the goal, the ideals that we, we have for this is that we want just to have a few laws, but we want those, fews to, those few laws to explain as many physical processes as many physical processes or physical phenomena or, or different situations as possible. If for every situation I encounter, I need to make a new law of physics, again, that doesn't give it any predictive power. So, because I could just come up with a new situation and have to start from scratch. And usually this is done through a method of, of successive approximations. So what, what this means is we're not going to get all of the laws that explain absolutely everything in the universe, taking everything into account perfectly right off the, right off the start. For instance, if I have a, uh, let's say I'm trying to consider how a ball flies through the air, so just projectile motion. Well, at the beginning, I'm not going to worry about the fact that the ball is made up of individual atoms and they're bouncing off individual atoms in the air. I'm going to start by saying, well, let's just assume that I'm in a vacuum so I don't have to worry about air resistance and, and that the gravitational force in this small region is, is about constant. These are all approximations that allow us to solve the simple system. And then we say, all right, what happens when I add in air resistance? What happens if the ball's starting to rotate and, and have different aerodynamic effects? So, so this successive approximation idea uh, comes up a lot and is very important to have a realistic vision of what theories are, are considered to be correct and when can we consider these theories to be correct? When are these approximations actually valid? So to start, let's look at a couple of the, of the key guys uh, in physics over, over the last few centuries and see some of the big revolutions in physics and kind of fit them into this framework. So, so we have Newton, uh, so we have Newton's laws of motion, and what this did in, in looking at the idea we want a few laws to describe many physical phenomenon, in this, for Newton, we had, let's say I have the ground, and I have, have a ball, and I can throw the ball. So we have motions of objects on the Earth, and we also have, let's say I have the sun over here, 
and the motions of, of the planets uh, orbiting around the sun. Newton took, was able to figure out a law of gravitation that took these motions on the surface of the Earth and these motions out in space of, of celestial objects in the heavens, and he was able to say, I can describe that with the same simple laws. Uh, so, so that's one example of how we want just a few laws to describe as many physical processes at once. And this was a huge revolution in, in understanding the universe. Uh, we have uh, Maxwell in, in the 1860s, I believe, came up with the came up with Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism, which were uh, originally worked on by by Faraday and Oersted and, and other people helped this as well. And this says that electricity, so things like lightning bolts or, or circuits that I can make, electric circuits that can power lights, electricity and magnetism, so the motion of a, of a compass needle or, or things like that, these are directly connected. I can use changing electric fields to produce magnetism. And if I have a, a magnet going through a coil of wire, I can produce electricity, and this was another, I, I hardly have to say uh, how valuable this was for being able to come up with all of the electric, uh, electric devices that we have today. So again, we had two separate physical phenomena beforehand, and we were able to say, I can describe both of these things with the same set of laws. Uh, in the early 1900s, Einstein came along and changed our ideas of, of space and time. So instead of calling, saying that uh, these are completely separate things that all people will agree on, depending on your frame of reference, that might change how you perceive space and time. Going to general relativity, we say that uh, matter is going to curve space and time, and these ideas are not separate but connected. Uh, and we also have, in in this case, probably the most uh, the most well known equation in the world, E equals m c squared. And this is saying that energy is closely related to mass, is is identically related to mass. So these are were before Einstein, energy and mass were thought of as, as separate things, but he says, no, we're going to use the same laws to describe both of them. And, and in, uh, later in the 1930s, when quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics was coming around, this was saying, well, we can describe the, the particle and wave nature Uh, the particle of wave nature and wave nature of, of both light and of other objects like electrons can show electrons which we normally consider particles can display properties of waves and and these two separate kind of ways of looking at at particles and waves were brought together using quantum mechanics so that describes a lot of how we want to try and take just a few laws to describe as many physical phenomena as, as we can. Now, this idea of successive approximation is also present when we when we consider these uh, these continuing revolutions in physics. For for Newtonian physics, his equations work very well when we're in small gravitational fields or when the speeds of objects are, are much less than the speed of light, where we have generally slow-moving objects. Whereas Einstein, uh, so, so those are the approximations that Newton has. And then later on, we were able to get more accurate and say Einstein can account for when particles are moving close to the speed of light, or when we have very strong gravitational fields. That doesn't mean that the equations Newton came up with are wrong. It simply means that 
we need to be careful of when we are using Newton's equations. If, if we're dealing with things that are just moving around on the earth, Newton's equations work just fine. But if we're dealing with things like extremely sensitive uh, time measurements of GPS, we have to consider that you know space and time are different for moving observers and observers which are in different gravitational fields. In the same way, Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism, which view electromagnetism as a wave, are assuming that we have so many photons, photons being the individual particles that make up light, as described by quantum mechanics, they're saying that there's so many of these that we really need to, uh, that we can just ignore the particle effects of light and just deal with the, with the wave effects. In this approximation, Maxwell's equations work out perfectly well, but if we're dealing with individual photons, well, then we have to go to the quantum picture. So that kind of shows how the process of physics is a process of successive approximation. We start with the simple system and then say, how can we describe more and more effects? So there's two sides of physics which are essential for, for coming up with good theories. First, we have the, the theory side. So people coming up with equations that they believe describe the real world. And then just as important, there's experiment. And these and the experiments are, okay, let's go out into the real world and set up an experiment such that we can test whether these theories are right. And these two both have to complement each other in order for a theory to be good. If you have a theory that has no experimental evidence behind it, well, then it's not going to be a good theory. You have to be, in order for a theory to be good, you have to have an opportunity for it to be testable or for it to be disproven. So let's say I do an experiment and I see some strange effect in nature, then they'll say, okay, I'm going to send that over to the theorist to try to say, how can you develop a framework such that the results of this experiment make sense. And, and the theorists will work on that for a while and they'll say, I've come up with a new theory. This theory predicts some strange, may predict some strange effect that maybe you guys haven't been looking for yet. So the theory will say, maybe you should look for for this other effect that I have predicted and that'll go back to the experiment side they'll they'll be able to look for that and and this kind of interplay is really the way that good physics is done you need both theory and experiment uh, if you do an experiment and can't explain it then that's not a very good situation but if you have some picture of the universe but no way to check whether or not it's actually accurate, that's also, also a serious problem. So in order to do good physics, you need both theory and experiment. And this is hopefully provided uh, at least a reasonable idea of how these revolutions in physics have come on because they've been driven by, ex by experiment viewing the motions on the earth and the motions in the heaven or viewing the effects of electricity and magnetism going back to the theory side how can we describe those strange effects together and then returning to experiment to try to find a uh, new phenomenon to study and and new ways to understand the universe around us